Please. Perhaps my next guest can. He's been nicknamed Dr. No for rejecting bills that let big government get even bigger. He's a staunch defender of the Constitution and sound money, and he wants to be the president. Earlier in front of the National Debt Clock, a few blocks from here in New York City, I talked to him about big government interference with our freedoms and our property and how that can be stopped. Take a listen. Sitting on the corner of West 44th Street and 6th Avenue in the middle of New York City with Republican Congressman Ron Paul. We happen to be seated right across the street from the National Debt Clock, which Congressman Paul, as I read it now, says 14.6 trillion. Is that the true number? And if it were, is it capable? Is the American government capable of paying that back? No, they can't pay it back, and it's much bigger if you look at all the entitlement obligations. <laughs> Nobody knows that number, 60, 70, 80 trillion dollars. That would be the obligation. You know, if you had an insurance company, you have to have money in the bank to pay off the people that you bought, you know, that bought insurance. Right. But in our case, all these promises and obligations, all, all depends on future tax collections. And they can't do it. It's way out of control. They've been buying vote for these many, many decades. And, and the country really technically is bankrupt. And they all admit it, just like Greece is bankrupt. The sooner they admit it and the sooner they, uh, you know, liquidate their debt and default, the better. But we, we cannot pay this debt. We should make the effort to pay our way out of it. And that, of course, is what I talk about, is uh, that we should absolutely make the effort by cutting spending and changing foreign policy and, you know, these other things I've talked about, right? Cutting spending, changing foreign policy. What could the president on his own do to cause us to stop spending money and to respect the personal liberties of individuals in America? Well, the president has a lot of prerogatives. First, he could use the veto pen constantly, and that would cut, uh, that would send a message to the business community that, you know, the end is coming. We're not going to continue to spend like this. But he also could use the power of enforcement. I don't know why a president should feel obligated to enforce unconstitutional laws and regulations. He should just back off. Or even to spend money that he believes is unconstitutionally authorized. Yeah, and he spends money, of course, that he doesn't have. I mean, starting a new war, like in Libya, I didn't even have the courtesy of mentioning it to the Congress. I mean, that has to stop. It's an attitude. It's a psychology that's been around, not just with this president, but it's been around and been developing for many decades. So it's out of control. I think that that psychology and attitude sometimes pervades into other parts of the government. For example, just this past weekend, the police commissioner of the city of New York, Ray Kelly, who once was the head of the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, said that the New York City police have the hardware and the will to shoot down planes or enemies from the sky that, in his view, might be attacking the city. Question, is it the job of the local police to be shooting down planes in the sky, no matter what evil they may think is coming from them? And you use their might. Yes. <laughs> it might be. Might. Well, it sounds rather aggressive and abuse of power, scary. When you think of the judicial system, and you know a lot about that, just think of what they do illegally and uh, the way the system works. And now they talk about assassinating American citizens, not giving proper, uh, you know, habeas corpus, per, you know, protection. So it really, really is out of control. But this is where I'm encouraged, especially when I'm talking to young people. They're, they're tired of it all. They understand it, and they want their freedom. They know they're not going to get taken care of by the government. I think that's the best thing that's happened, is the attitude of young people realize that they're not going to be taken care of. And they'd like, and you know, we, they talk about opting out of, of Obamacare. I talk about opting out of the whole system. That's And that's what the young people like. Were you as scandalized as I was uh, when you were standing on the stage in a couple of those debates? and the crowd wouldn't let you answer a question and roared as if to suggest that somebody should die because they couldn't get health care. And the crowd roared when one of your uh, opponents suggested, well, we, we execute a lot of people in our state. And the crowd booed at a serviceman in Iraq because he acknowledged that he was gay. Did that type of behavior on the part of people from whom you want votes disturb you? It really does, and, and I try to, you know, talk to myself and say maybe it's hopefully it's not quite that bad and I don't think it is because at the same time I hear that and this is a certain group that goes you know to these uh, uh, these uh, debates but when I go to campuses where the young people are thinking about liberty 
they don't have the, they don't boo that stuff. They cheer. My position's on this that we shouldn't be talking like that at all. It might surprise a lot of people watching us to know that there's another group of young people who support you overwhelmingly, and those are members of the United States military. In fact, there was recently a, a, an editorial called "You Want Him," and this was in a military newspa newspaper, and the hymn was referring to you. And in this editorial, it reflected that you get a larger percentage of political contributions from active duty and retired military than the other Republican candidates combined. How can that be? Are they telling us something? I think their lives are on the line, and they've been ripped off. They've been sent over. What is, you know, I was in the active military, then I was in the guard. Right. But the guard is supposed to guard us. Reserves are supposed to be there in case we were attacked. But now, you, you know, the services are so worn down, they send some of these guard units and reserve units overseas. They're worn out. And just think of the, nobody talks about the cost in human life. You know, 8,000 Americans have died in these wars that are illegal and, you know, not, not declared. 40,000 severe injuries. And all I do is talk about, look, if we need to defend this country, we do. I tried my best when I was in the military. Right. But uh, we, we just can't continue to do that. I think the military liked the idea of somebody being cautious. I certainly was looking for somebody cautious in 1965 when LBJ escalated the Vietnam War. Right. I wasn't all that happy about that. So right. I, can, I can identify with why um, active military people are sympathetic to what I'm saying. As, as wrong as it was for George W. Bush to have invaded uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Wasn't that evil compounded by paying for it on a credit card? Stated differently, in a year or so, we'll be gone. We'll still owe $2 trillion for, for a war that will have been history and will not have made us any freer or any safer. Yeah, first, they went, went into war the wrong way. The war wasn't necessary for our national security, and what you mentioned is, is paying for it. But history is pretty accurate in that uh, most wars are paid for it through debasement of the currency, you know. Right. Uh, and that, that has been, yeah, infla inflating the currency. So that is pretty traditional. So that's why you should be absolutely cautious about going to war because it has economic consequences. How fearful are you about debasement of the currency? The great empire throughout history, which America aspires to be, wrongfully in your view and in mine, have collapsed when their dollars weren't worth anything, when people couldn't even buy food with the amount of money they had in their pockets or their banks or under their beds. Hundreds and hundreds of times in my lifetime, you know, uh, I could name a dozen countries that have gone through this. So, so it always happens. And this whole idea, what I'm surprised is, is how aggressively people defend paper. Like, paper is saintly. You mean you would attack the Federal Reserve and the paper standard? But most of those people have uh, benefits that they're going to derive. You know, you might be on the receiving end of those funds in the military industrial complex or on the entitlement system, so they don't want those funds but, to be cut off. But do you think that if we keep up as we're doing, if the Fed continues to print money, if the government continues to spend trillions that it doesn't have, that our currency eventually will become so debased and a loaf of bread might cost a hundred dollars. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, just think if, uh, what, what, what's happened since, uh, you know, 1971, you know, gold was $35 an ounce, you know, uh, the dollar continually is debased. The big question is, is it going to totally destroy and go to zero, which right. would be really a tragedy. I hope we come to our senses and that we say, you know, we better cut back and come home and we better, you know, live within our means. So um, I, I think we should work for it, but we better be prepared for one way runaway current, you know, inflation, and that's a lot worse than what we've just gone through financially. It's much, much more serious. You have consistently remained throughout this pre-primary period. We're now at the end of September. The first caucuses and primaries are in January uh, and February. You have consistently remained between 10 and 14 uh, percent of, uh, of the Republican vote in, in, in all the polls, whether people want to reveal the outcome <laughs> of the polls or not, you are there. We actually saw a poll the other day in which you were second, and it said Mitt Romney first, Rick Perry third, <laughs> or Michelle Bachman fourth, we're the only know how to count. Is the Republican Party starting to take you seriously? Do they recognize that your ideas and articulation of them have caught fire amongst young people, even people my age, throughout the country? 
No, I think so, and I think some of them worry about it. Maybe they don't want uh, us to get that message out too strongly, but so they're sort of trying to water it down, and they take the message. You know, that's not an unknown thing in history. Water down a message and take hold of it and say, I'm, you know, I'm attacking the Federal Reserve, you know, or something like that, well, but they don't really believe it. We've, we've seen a little of that from some of your opponents who said, we favor auditing the Fed. They didn't say that four years ago. Well, that's that's good sign, and some of them are saying, well, maybe it's time we ought to think about bringing those troops home from Afghanistan. Yeah, it's about time we started thinking about Before that. Before I let you go, what are you doing here in the middle of New York City? Oh, don't ask me that. I don't know. <laughs> Why would I come here? No, I'm going to be on a show tonight. Uh, I don't know whether I can mention that show or oh, not. Oh, you can mention that show because he's very fond of you <laughs> and of your night watchman chatting with you. Uh, I think his name is Stewart, John Stewart there or something like go. that. There you so, go. I don't know. Comedy Central, I'll uh, say. Yeah, it. okay. You've heard of that show? I have, yes. <laughs> Well, I wish you the best of luck there, and it's a pleasure uh, chatting with you. Congressman Ron Paul, back to me in the studio.